Um, I'm going to kind of go by season, but I'm also going to incorporate wildlife and landscape photography throughout the whole thing. So the first, uh, this slide that you're looking at, this uh, Smoky Mountain slide, this was taken from the missing link three years before it opened. So I was very fortunate to know the, uh, the boss engineer of the project and he invited me up there to do some pictures of um, the crew pouring two of the bridges. And I went up the first day and I captured this shot and some others while I was photographing all of this crew. But then I asked for permission to go up the second day and he said, what time? And we were starting, believe it or not, at five in the morning. And the reason being is they had a super moon that evening. So at five in the morning, I was able to shoot a super moon uh, setting in the western sky over Townsend. I didn't include that. Uh, as you know, an hour goes really fast, but I just wanted to give you an idea of um, the shots that you can take from the missing link section of the Foothills Parkway, which took 50 years to build. So every spring we get overloaded with people that are looking for photography of our wildflowers. That being said, you need to know that wildflowers are in the Smoky Mountains all but two months. So January 15th is usually the time frame of our first wildflower, which is our Lenten roses. And it goes all the way pretty much to November 15th. So the first slide is a white trillium. And what I want you to remember when you're photographing uh, trillium and other flowers is look at them from all perspectives. So this is looking straight down on the flower not the way that we usually photograph a single flower. Sometimes we do a group of flowers that way. So this is a white trillium from straight down. Whereas the red trillium I'm taking from the side. So these uh, come out in the March timeframe and they're popular through March and April. And by the way, those are found almost everywhere in the park, especially the white and the yellow. The red, you have to kind of get some trail maps and, you know, talk to some people and find out some better opportunities for those. But they're not that hard to find either. Now, these two, uh, the pink and the yellow lady slipper are a little different. The pink is found a little more easily. Um, both of these were taken on Schoolhouse Gap Trail. And... If you know anything about white oak sinks, you know that it's been closed for several years now, but they always open it in the spring for the uh, wildflower pilgrimage. So take a look at that. And if you're interested in doing um, some guided uh, uh, different types, they have everything from identification of trees to wildflowers to birds, you know, they have everything. Uh, check out the, uh, annual wildflower pilgrimage and it's a good way to get involved with some of those uh, guided hikes. So you're going to see some slides tonight that are just outside of the Smoky Mountains but remember that um, first of all unless you're camping in the Smokies you don't stay there's no hotels or anything in the Smoky Mountains so you're going to be staying in some of these towns that border the Smoky Mountains. So you're going to see some of these, uh, some of this photography that's taken from border towns. So this is in Sevier County in Seymour, and this is called the Island View Schoolhouse. So the minute I took this photograph, I knew that it was going to be a black and white. So how do you look for black and white images like before you take them? Sharp uh, edges and multiple angles are always really good for black and white photography. Then the other thing I'll tell you about this particular image is that uh, like some of the churches and cabins that you'll find in the Smoky Mountains, it usually has a not so pleasing uh, below the cabin itself. 
So some of these structures were lifted up with stones and rocks and uh, concrete block. So what I had to do to take this image to block a lot of that negative space was to lay down in the field and get the longer grass to cover that for me. The only, uh, the biggest thing you got to worry about there is the uh, steamy um, cow patties. So this was taken in a cow pasture. This is a young red shoulder hawk and this is uh, some of the wildlife that I'm fortunate enough to have in my own yard. Um, one of the things I'll say about uh, younger hawks will allow you to approach them and get closer to the, uh, to the animal itself, to the bird. So it gives you more opportunity. This is an Eastern cottontail. Um, one of the things you want to look at doing, and you've heard this before, is to uh, stay low to your subjects. You know, they say eye level, sometimes even below eye level. Um, it gives you a whole different perspective in your photography. So, and this, uh, this was taken in Maryville, Tennessee, which is just outside of the Smokies. And you can see that the grasses and stuff just tower over the subject laying in the grass. So we're gonna to go to a different location now, and this is the Roaring Fork Nature Trail. So uh, you, ha you have to watch for the timing and when this trail will open and close. It's not really a set time. Um, generally, the, like the beginning of May through November, each year it's different, and with a COVID year, everything has changed. This is the Bud Ogle Cabin. And one of the things, uh, I like to talk about a lot is natural framing. Those of you that are uh, older than like 30 years old know about this. Uh, when we shot in film days, we had to um, use a lot of natural framing and spend a lot of time doing setup work on a landscape photograph. And we'll get into some other things on structures a little later, but Bud Ogle Cabin is on the beginning of the Roaring Fork um, Nature Motor Trail, and uh, always a good photograph to take. So most of my uh, black bears that I do, almost all of it is in Cades Cove, but in this particular situation, um, I came across on Roaring Fork, I came across this mom with two cubs, and it was uh, funny to watch, and I stayed at a long distance for this because I really wanted to let her be natural. But at about 100 yards from the road, I watched as she nudged her cubs up the tree, kind of like a timeout situation. And then she really began to relax and she rolled back and forth and put her legs up the tree. So the other thing I will say, if you have an opportunity like this, don't be careful that you don't lose it because of a uh, tourist. So there was a couple times during this situation where I had to pretend I was actually looking at something on the other side of the road so that the cars would go by. Once I felt like I had the shots that I needed, then I didn't you know, do that anymore. And I let everybody in on seeing what was happening and sharing the experience. But uh, she, was a, she was a lot of fun. She looked like she had a really hard night the night before. But um, this is a mom of two cubs. So now we're in the Metcalf Bottoms area of the Smoky Mountains, and this is the Little Greenbrier Schoolhouse. So I told you we'd talk a little more about structures. So typically we like to photograph our Smoky Mountain structures and all structures from about a 30 to 45 degree angle from the front, and that just gives us a, a large depth of field and it gives us a 3D composition. But pay attention to this building if you ever go to it in the width of the logs themselves. Um, five logs make up the whole sidewall. Uh, really beautiful structure. And there's a lot of history in this area. Uh, this is where the Walker sisters taught at the school. And we're using natural framing again to block a little bit of the harsh light in the trees behind it. And Think about that angle from the front, so you do have that 3D feel. 
but you also need to be thinking outside the box. So one of the things you have to do is s discover your own style of photography or set yourself a, a style of your own. And one of the ways you can do that is always think of uh, up and down as well as left and right and in and out. And on this particular shot, I'm laying down on the ground and I decided that the gate to the trail leading to the schoolhouse was going to give me a really pleasing approach uh, showing the line to the building itself. So this is again the little Greenbrier schoolhouse. So here we're going to jump into Townsend, Tennessee, my hometown. And uh, in 2019, I did four different fox dens, but in 2020 this year, I concentrated on only one den. So I spent a lot of time there early morning and uh, late afternoon. This particular red fox had five kits and got to know them pretty well and watch them grow through the months. So the time frame on your red fox is usually going to be that April 1st to June 1st time frame. So May is the biggest month, mainly because when they're really tiny, she keeps them close and uh, they don't do too much activity. But as they get older, she lets them roam and learn and they start hunting bugs in the grass and those types of things. So I got to know them really well, enough to put up a few, if you want to call them props, you can, but natural settings that would allow me to get good photography if the grass got too long. So I did throw out a big long um, log that was about 20 feet long for them to run across. And then also a stump that every once in a while one would take a break and watch the others and you're able to capture shots like this. So two of the five uh, doing a little play action here. So the, one of the other things I did is I left some long grass, like about two foot long, where they could jump into that and get some shots of that. But I also mowed some, some areas here and there to make sure when they were small that I could capture them um, and not be lost in the grass itself. This is still in Townsend, and uh, unfortunately, this structure isn't there anymore. Um, this is right when you turn at the one light that we have in town on Wares Valley Road. And uh, it was recently purchased, and the, the barn was knocked down. But I still wanted to use it in the presentation to tell you about how you can use uh, everybody loves barn photography, but if you can find a situation where you have a barn in the foreground and then show your Smoky Mountains in the background, it really gives, uh, it depicts a, a really good uh, idea of what it's like here in this area. So this is an almost mature bald eagle. It's about four years old. And we know that because the head isn't pure white, has just a little bit of brown left. And one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to use this image was to remind people if you have long lenses, if you stay at a longer distance and a bird is higher up in the tree, that angle is less critical and you feel closer to eye level, even though the bird may be 20 or 30 feet above you. So you're in a better situation if you stay at a longer distance and then crop it later, and then you still have that feeling that you're, the bird isn't that high in the tree. If you get right below the bird and shoot up, then you have a, a steeper angle, and you always feel like that, you know, the bird's like way out of touch and you want a more intimate feel to your uh, wildlife photography and your uh, bird photography. So this is the way that we do that. And also watch for your contrasting colors. So in this pine tree, the brown, the white, and the yellow really contrast against the, the green pine. So this is a, an old farmhouse that is in Greenback, Tennessee, which is near Maryville. And it's another example of when you take a photograph looking for something that will 
uh, change easily and look really good in a black and white format. And because of all the uh, tones of the rust in the roof, and then all the lines and all the angles and stuff, this uh, makes your photography more pleasing as a black and white. Some of my images have a name because they, they have sold so many times and it's easy for me to uh, know what to call it and my wife that runs the gallery. So this is called The Eagle Has Landed. It was a play on our NASA days when we were landing space stations and when we were landing on the moon. And this was taken in Lenore City. So if you come from uh, Georgia, sometimes you will come through Lenore City. And this is a nest that I was on for about five years. And the reason that it's in the presentation is to talk about when you're doing raptors, some of the best photography is the takeoff and the landing. So this is a really good example of the arch of the back and the landing and how the wings are, they were in the stall when they were lifting up and now they're in the the actual landing, so the stall is ending. So this is what creates really attractive uh, raptor and bird uh, photography. And I wanted to go over that real quick. So now we're in smack in the middle of the national park again. And this is called, well, it has several names, but I call it the Sawtooth Ridge. And this is one of the ridges that comes off from Mount Lacan. And to get to it, you take the Alum Cave Trail. And this is the eye of the needle. So it's, a, it's kind of a famous place. People hike sometimes to see the eye of the needle. Sometimes they hike to go to the Alum Cave. And others want to go all the way to the top of Mount Lacan. But what you have inside of the eye of the needle is one of our animals, birds that was put back into the park, and that's the peregrine falcon. And if you look below it a little bit and to the left, uh, just to the left of those three or four uh, Catawba rhododendron, you'll see its mate in the shadows there. So if you look to the far left of the image, you'll see a really large Catawba rhododendron, and that's where the nest was that year. And this was taken a few years ago. So it's a really tough hike, um, especially at our age, I guess. Most of us are probably the, uh, in the retirement age group. I know some aren't, but, but it's worth it to get this type of uh, images. As you can see, the sawtooth ridge really pops up the ridge that's further behind it and this is looking to the west so early morning uh, or late morning actually would probably be about the best because the sun does have to go over Mount Lacan and those hilltops so this is a another image uh, that was taken in my yard and it took a long time to get the shot because this is probably, I don't, I don't know the age exactly, maybe a week or two old, and it was very small. So uh, Eastern Cottontail and in our grass, it was say four inches tall, it was hard to do any photography. But by waiting out the situation, I was able to uh, get the baby bunny when it stood up, and that was one of one of the few shots that was really worth too much during that shoot. So the patience of waiting for the stand up to get the height over the grass was important in this situation. So I know that a lot of you are going to be doing some sunrises and one of the locations is a Conalupti Overlook that people do sunrises. This one is shooting over the top of that. This is at the very beginning of the Klingman's Dome Road. And 
One of the things that you can do with sunrises is do the diffraction where uh, the rays, you break the rays off the edge of a limb. And that's what I'm doing in this situation. So a conolepti uh, overlook and this particular location is good for summer and fall. But other than that, it rises further to the left. So that's one thing you got to think about. You know that there's apps on uh, that you can use that will show you where the uh, sunrise will take place along with what time and that type of thing. But using diffraction is a, a nice uh, way to get more rays in your um, sunrise itself. So this is a Calderwood Dam. And there's probably a good chance that some of you have seen the Chilhowee Dam, which is below it. This is higher elevation, and this is on the tail of the dragon. And one of the things I wanted to talk about on this image, and if you have a situation like this, is to remember your foreground. So you have a, a good sky because you do have some activity in the clouds and those type of things. And you have a, a funnel effect where you're being brought in by the both sides of the image. But don't forget your foreground. So your foreground is framing the rest of the image. And it's also adding a little bit of color. So be, be mindful of foregrounds when you're doing your landscape photography. A lot of us think about, you know, what's happening in the sky and we tend to forget the foreground sometimes. So this is a coyote and it was taken in Kate's Cove. We're going to be um, talking about Kate's Cove for a little while. We're gonna do some of the structures and some of the wildlife. And I included this image because I wanted to talk to you a little bit about getting off the roads of Cade's Cove and maybe walking into the center. If you do so, you're gonna have a good chance of experience wildlife that you haven't seen before, or you're gonna see it more often than you normally do. In this particular situation, I walked into the center and I found a uh, 20 foot tall tree near a creek and I sat down at the base of it and I kind of waited for something to happen. Luckily, I happened to be downwind um, from this animal and he got within about 20 foot before he even realized that I was there. So whenever you have a close up photography of wildlife of this size, it makes for critical sharpness and you can see like the uh, fly that's on its right ear on the left side of the image. So remember to uh, get off the uh, beaten path and make your own path sometimes to get more opportunities on the wildlife of Cades Cove. So this image has a name. This is called the Meadow Pathway. And you can study history of the cove and it will, it will give, you, give your images a little more meaning. And also if you ever meet people that grew up there or lived there, it, um, it allows you to listen better, I guess would be one thing because you know a little bit of what they're talking about. So in 1850, there was as many as 650 people living in Cades Cove and as late as the 70s and 80s, there was a lot more structures than what you're seeing today. At this location, this is where the big parking area is um, after the three churches. And you're looking down over the meadow and uh, Hyatt Lane is going through the center. And you have a, uh, a location that was a two-story home called the Spradlin Place here at one time. Uh, some of you may know that two families were allowed to uh, stay in Cades Cove and Kermit Calhoun was called Mr. Cades Cove. His wife was related to the Spradlins. But also take a look at your trails. So don't forget to use trails, roads, and pathways to lead your eye into your images on your landscape photography. 
And in the background, this is not um, the Appalachian Trail because there is a ridge that's in the foreground here. Uh, the Appalachian Trail will go behind this ridge. And also an interest in sky, so always be watching for your skies. This particular image is called Superdog. And years ago, I used to make fun of people that always tried to do photography from their cars. And then as time went on, I started doing it a little bit. And in this particular case, it was uh, the, the coyote made me stay in my vehicle. So I tried to get out a few times and you can see how long that grass is. So they mow about 10 to 15 feet right beside the road. This is on Hyatt Lane. And every time I tried to get out of my vehicle, it would go into this long grass and it would go deep into the long grass where I couldn't follow it. So I'd get back into my truck and he would come back out and he'd start hunting again. So he was uh, laying down all the rules, so I just abided by them. So now I just had to stay ahead of him a little bit and kind of shoot back so that I could get the angles that I wanted. And once I saw the ears go up, I knew a jump was about to happen. So he did this uh, three times that day and I was able to catch this shot where the feet are probably four to five feet off the ground and his head's possibly eight feet off the ground. And he did catch what he was after, bowl, mole. This particular shot is at the Oliver Tipton place. So we talk about natural framing and then you have to think about your balance as well. So sometimes your trees and your um, limbs and your brush can actually add the right balance and weight to your photography. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So this is a smokehouse that's at the Tipton place. And the tree on the left is weighting uh, the, or balance in the image. And this is just to the right of the, the main structure of the house itself. So there's about five or six buildings at this location. And obviously this is uh, spring green and we're gonna start moving forward to uh, summertime soon here. So one of the things about the turkeys in Cades Cove, if you're interested in photographing the turkeys, is a lot of people wanna get either the strut where the tail is fanned or they want to get the wings spread like this. So if you know your subjects a little better, then you can anticipate and be ready for this to happen. When you see a turkey preening and you know that it's already been preening for several minutes, don't switch to another turkey because it's a good possibility that this is going to be the next thing to happen. So after the preening, usually comes the wing spread. And this is uh, at the location, uh, looks like a helicopter uh, pad is out there. They mow out. It's right before Shady Lane. And uh, it took about 30 minutes to do a slow approach out there to the subject. Cantilever barn that's at the Tipton place as well. Um, mainly watch your skies. So the sky is a little bit hot here. It's probably taken at the wrong time of the day. And so because of that, I'm using the trees to block a lot of the harsh light. And again, I'm at a, probably a 30 degree angle so that I can see the depth of the barn. So we talked about staying at a distance. One, it allows the wildlife to be natural. But the other thing it allows you to do is to have the capability to turn vertical even with longer lenses. So when I was photographing this black bear family, um, this started to happen. And I spent about five seconds turning my gear so I could get into vertical orientation and was able to get all four in the one shot going up the tree. So a little bit of follow the leader going on here. Um, always a pleasing photo when I post this on 
social media or if I show it to a friend. Um, it's not something you can get very often, get four or five different bears in one shot. So I got started in nature and wildlife photography um, with my owls and the owls of Cades Cove. That being said, we don't have as many owls as we did 30 years ago when I started uh, going up there every weekend. But they've learned to adapt. So what has happened is the stress of the coyote uh, has affected some other animals and the owl is one of the animals that it has affected. So we used to have a lot of rabbits, groundhogs, and even um, chipmunks. So you don't see many of those animals anymore. You still have a lot of gray squirrels, but a lot of, and, and another one would be Bob White. So a lot, we have lost a lot of those animals. They have either moved on or they've been decimated by the coyote population. But owls have learned to adapt. And now the best place to look for owls in Cades Cove and the Smoky Mountains is along Creek, right above creeks actually. So they like to be about 10 feet off the water and they are searching for crawdads. So they have become and, and got a taste for crawdads in the creeks. And this is one of the top spots to find them. So I was guiding a client this summer and I showed her an owl in Cades Cove. I talked to her about how this happens. We're coming out of Cades Cove down the mountain and she spots one on Laurel Creek. So this is the one that we photographed on Laurel Creek. So when you are looking for your own style and looking for different ways to photograph things that you have done before, one of the things is the backside of cabins. So you have to do a little bit more walking and you start looking for your landscape shot. Of course, the thing difficult about this is it's usually looking more into the light. So be sure if you uh, are doing this kind of a walk, it's about a quarter mile out to this cabin, you bring a backpack and think about bringing your filters. So by using a graduated neutral density filter, you can block some of the harsh light in the top part of the frame and expose correctly for your cabin. And now you're taking a shot of something you might have photographed several times before from the backside and from a completely different angle with different lighting for sure. Of course, if you do this in the rain or an overcast day, then you don't have to worry about some of those issues. So one of the things that every, well, not everybody, but a lot of people like to photograph is the, the bucks of Cades Cove. And there's two different ways of doing that. And sometimes you can do both with the same subject. So the image on the left would be a tight shot of head and shoulders and rack that you might want to uh, post showing the size of the deer or if you're a professional and you're selling to magazines or something like that. So that is that style of photography. Me personally, I like the style on the right. So I like to show the whole animal. Um, you can tell by uh, the image on the right that it's not in rut because the neck isn't swollen. So you get a little more feel about what time of year it could be according to the surroundings and the size of the animal. The picture on the right means a little bit more to me as well because it was one of the days that I got up to the gate and the gate wasn't locked the night before. So I'm in the back of the cove at like six in the morning and sunrise is listed at 615. So I get all my gear out, I see some bucks in the field, and just within five minutes, I was laying down and getting the lighting that I wanted on the subject, waiting for the right head angle. So that's the other thing you want to think about with your uh, white-tailed deer is the head angle. I find the, the image on the right real pleasing, and this is what I'm looking for when I'm photographing white-tailed deer. Once you get later into the summer, you get into the July and August, the racks are bigger, still have the velvet. 
but you look for uh, different conditions in the fields and where they're at. And one of the things I like is the Queen Anne's lace. So when you have this green and the thistle mixed in and then your white of the Queen Anne's lace, it gives you a really different uh, background and composition to your image itself. Again, we're looking for the right head angle so I think that the level of the grass is really good. It's below the shoulder, and then the, all the neck is exposed, and then I'm waiting for the ears is the other thing. So you want the ears perked and look uh, pointed towards you, and you want the right head angle to show the rack in the best display. So we're in the August time frame now, and one of the things that we look for in August are the cherry trees. So if you want to follow uh, the bears and know where to find the bears, you think about the food source. So once you get to the August time frame, um, the early blackberries are gone. You're at the very end of the blackberry season and the cherries, wild cherries start coming in. So now we start looking for the bears more in the trees than on the ground. Um, this particular tree had pretty much been eaten out by larger bears, but they couldn't go out to the smaller limbs on the very outskirts of the, of the limbs, and the smaller cubs from that year were able to get out there and get them. And this guy uh, was kind of pretending he was a big bear and showing off a little bit, so I took advantage of that situation. Uh, people do ask if it was rain, and it wasn't. You can see the sun's out. That's just that early morning dew on the tree. And as he's going through the limbs, he's just getting saturated. So for the most part, we have just the one hummingbird in the eastern part of the United States. Ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, when you do hummingbird photography, I'll, I'll give you a few tips on that. One of the things you wanna look for is something um, in the frame that will show the size of the bird. So here, this is a, a crawling type of vine and you know that the leaves aren't that big. And so you see in the size of the bird. Yeah, the bird looks big because it's blown up uh, and I was so close to the subject, but you can get a relative feel of how large the hummingbird is, how large its beak is, so look for those type of things and also look for contrasting colors. So now some people find it really difficult to photograph hummingbirds. So I'm gonna give you a tip on that. Don't worry about the wings. Usually people don't care if the wings are blurred because that shows movement and it's so hard to try to freeze the wings anyways. Um, you should spend more focus on how to capture a pleasing uh, composition with the head and the eye being sharp. So one of the things a hummingbird does is when it approaches a flower, it usually stops just inches away from it before it dips in. So it almost comes to a stall, then it dips into the flower, and then it usually comes back out to the same position it was in before, and then it flies to the next flower. So one of the things I do is if I'm not wanting the fly, flower involved, I try to get it when it's positioned a couple inches away from it. And then if I want to get it dipping into the flower, I never lock onto the bird. I stay locked onto the flower and just make sure that I have speed to freeze the eye in the head and also enough aperture depth of field so that the leaves are in focus and the uh, flowers in focus and the bird itself. So that's a little tip uh, on doing uh, hummingbird photography. So many people try to follow the bird and, you know, uh, track a bird and stuff, and it's very difficult to do. This is Abrams Falls. It's a five-mile hike round trip. Um, soft imagery on the water. You know, we've been doing that for a long time. One of the things about the waterfalls in the Smoky Mountains, they never seem to go the right direction for you. Um, they always seem like they go like 
east from the left side to west on the right side. You never seem to get the lighting at your back. Of course, one way to neutralize all this is do your waterfalls um, on an overcast day or even a rainy day. It really makes for pleasing waterfalls. And remember that um, on overcast and rainy days, you can still use your polarizing filters. Um, they will still give you that nice pop of the color and stuff like that. Um, you just might, it'll even help you slow down the water. So you just got to watch your speed when you use one. So one of the residents of Cades Cove that we hear a lot and sometimes see is a pileated woodpecker. One of the things you want to think about when you're doing, this is a large bird, so you have a pretty good sized subject. Think about moving your feet so that your background is at a distance, and then you can create a bokeh such as this, and the image, uh, if you shoot it as wide open as you can, will feel like it's popping off the page. So that's what we're doing with this pileated woodpecker, really good black and white wood red, so those are uh, colors that will pop off the natural colors of brown and green that we see in the woods. So groundhogs, we used to have a lot more uh, all throughout the Smokies. Now, one of the top locations to see groundhogs is on the Blue Ridge Parkway. They mow about a five foot strip right along the road and they really like to feed on the grasses right along the road. So if you're, you know, on the Blue Ridge Parkway, I don't suggest anybody go looking for groundhogs because uh, usually you can find one on a trip that you're doing, um, but pay attention to the side of the road and this is the best location to get them. And this is similar to some of the other shots. So we um, can get, especially if the grass is high, we can get better images of the animal if they stand Groundhogs will stand very frequently. They love to uh, not pay attention for about 30 seconds and then to stand up and take a look around and check their surroundings. So this is Cable Mill in Cades Cove. And if you are interested in doing a, a shot like this in the fall, don't hesitate to do it. This tree has been in trouble for a long time and I haven't checked it in a few months, but um, as far as I know, it's still got the right side of the tree and it still has beautiful color. So um, I wouldn't hesitate. It won't be long that we're gonna lose this tree forever. One of the things to pay attention to when you're doing your fall colors is not only the leaves on the tree, but the leaves on the ground. So some of you know when you do your brooks and your mossy shots that if you have the colorful leaves on there, it really makes a beautiful contrast. Well, think about that for all of your landscape photography. Natural framing again, tree on the left side, your limb going across the top, and your fence pretty much on the bottom. All the things we look for. So this is on Hyatt Lane. Um, one of the few times that I shot with Bill Lee, and uh, I want to tell you a quick story about this. We got this image, and about a week later, a friend of ours had his bike stolen in Cades Cove. Bill sent him this image, and he said, look, I think I know what happened to your bike. So it's kind of funny. Um, we have fun with it for a while. We still talk about it once in a while. But uh, we got images of the black bear with his paw on the pedal, and then also putting his paw on the tire to almost try to roll the tire to see what it would do. So this is Spruce, Spruce Flat Falls, no relation to me, but it is a, a pleasing waterfall and it's not that long of a hike. It's 2.2 miles round trip. One thing you may not know about the waterfall is it does have a little cascade below it and I've been told it has a waterfall above it as well. So it's like a three tiered falls. I've never been there when the footing was good enough to get over the top of this one. So I haven't tried it. But another thing to know about your waterfalls is look below and above to see if it falls more than one time. 
And now we're going to move into the North Carolina side. This is a Biltmore Mansion. And I'm fortunate to have a friend that has season passes every year. And he can take in guests after 5 p.m. And one of the things you can do is go to this, what's called the Bass Pond, that's on the western side of it, and shoot with the sun setting behind you and lighting up the mansion itself. So it's a lot different than a lot of images you see that are taken from the front with the roadway and the walkways going up to the building. So this friend has 97 acres uh, just outside of the National Park. And um, I have been guiding some people over there. We have blinds set up on these old logging roads and stuff. And uh, every once in a while, while I'm doing bear photography and raccoons and stuff, a bobcat will jump out in front of me. And But I wanted to talk about patience. So when this happened at first, the cat came running right toward me chasing a squirrel. And it was so fast, of, it was happening so fast and he was going up and down over terrain, I probably wouldn't have been able to lock on and got a good shot. So I waited and the cat turned around immediately. So now I'm just hoping for the opportunity, but I'm being patient and waiting. And he walked away from me and then he went behind a tree and he started going perpendicular to me. And that's when I was able to obtain this shot. So the patience paid off. As soon as he heard the shutter, he looked at me and then I took another shot. The white squirrels that are in the um, Brevard area, um, I take them at Brevard College. So if you're interested in getting these right outside of the National Park, um, story goes that a uh, carnival truck had tipped over and a couple of the squirrels got loose. Uh, they were captured later by a resident and um, later on released again. And in the wild, they flourished. So Brevard College is where I um, get my images of the white squirrels. Not albino, by the way. Uh, you can see the dark eye. So it's just a white uh, coloration in the fur. Looking Glass Falls. So in the Brevard area, you have... Um, I think there's as many as 12 different waterfalls. DuPont, which is 30 minutes away, also has a bunch of waterfalls. So if you want to do a trip for waterfall photography in the Smoky Mountains, this is the, um, probably the one area that you can knock out the most of them. And a lot of them are real close to the road or on the right off the road. Um, so you really can, in a weekend trip, knock out a lot of waterfalls in Brevard, North Carolina. Looking Glass Falls gives you some options. You can go to the left, go to the right, and get in the center of it. Um, right now, that log is still there. Uh, it's been there for a little while now, so you can include the log if you want to, to, to give a little different color to it. So back on my friend's uh, property, um, we have some raccoons that come in. This was a mama of three babies, and she had a beautiful coat, one of the most beautiful coats I've ever seen on a raccoon. So sometimes a little bit of luck helps when you're doing wildlife photography. One of the things I do teach in wildlife photography, though, if you have multiple subjects around, like, say, butterflies, uh, take a close look at them before you start photographing and look for the specimens that are going to give you the most pleasing photography. No broken tails or a little more color or something like that. But in this situation, I didn't have to worry about it. This is uh, one of the beautiful, most beautiful coats on a raccoon I've ever seen. Staying low to the ground, that's uh, the key. I'm in a blind and I'm only feet off the ground. So we saw the red fox earlier. This is a gray fox. So the gray fox is the dominant fox in the Western United States, but it's a very timid animal. Um, in the eastern United States, we, we seem to have more red fox. The one thing that's different, of course, is the gray colored back and the black tip tail. So the red fox doesn't have the gray back and it has a white tip tail. But one thing uh, you should probably or may want to know about gray fox is they're one of only two canines in the world that can climb trees. 
So the African coon dog is the other. So they are able to evade uh, coyotes, which have put so many pressure, so much pressure on so many of our animals in the Smoky Mountains. So now we're over in the Cataluchi area, and this is Hiram Caldwell House. So uh, built in the early 1900s, a very modern home for the area. It's taken through his barn that he had, which is on the other side of the creek. So you can do this in Cades Cove as well. You can shoot like the cantilever barn through the blacksmith shop or, you know, shoot the building, the tipped in place itself through one of the barns. So there's multiple ways of doing that. But it always makes for a natural framing of um, because of the doorway. Um, and you do have that green around the house, so you have multiple colors and layers. It makes for a, a nice composition. So this is my friend, and um, I had seen videos and knew that the elk were getting a lot more used to people, but we got to witness it firsthand. Every time he turned to walk away, this uh, cow elk would like get close to him, almost wanting to smell him or maybe grab his shirt and find out you know, what he was all about. We also saw it reach his head inside of a vehicle. So one thing to know about Catalucci is the elk are very used to people now, more so than the Econolupti side. So the population is now, I think, in the 500 to 600. Uh, early morning is the best time. You can see the beautiful fog behind. And this is one of the bull elks that's uh, at Catalucci. And this was taken from a long ways away. So I um, took it with a long lens teleconverter, locked down on a tripod, and was able, maybe out of the 20 images I took of this big bull, this might have been the only one that was sharp enough to print and sell. You can see the size of his rack. He's, he's been around for a little while. So now we're back on the Blue Ridge Parkway and we're at a location that is called Lynn Cove Viaduct. I always want to call it Lynnville Viaduct. This is Lynn Cove Viaduct. I'm sorry, I hit that button. And um, the actual uh, bridge that most people photograph is just around the corner from this, but I wanted to take a shot of somebody doing uh, photography on the parkway with the fall colors. So this is my buddy again. And uh, we did this last fall. So time frame, the, the colors in the Smokies vary from the highest elevations in mid-October to here in Townsend, where we're only 900 feet above sea level, being peak the first and second week in November. So this is your cedar waxwing, and this is mountain ash berries that it's sitting on. So it's neat to find a couple groups of them to include into the image. This has been shot in a, a landscape format and then cropped to a vertical, and that's usually how I like to do my bird photography from this long of a distance with a smaller bird. And I wanted to show you a couple images of that. This is on the other side of the Lynn Cove viaduct. I think it's called Stack Rock. And um, really pretty color in that one area. We didn't have very much sunshine and we had a lot of fog that day. So there was only a few opportunities for some really colorful landscapes. Now we're over on the Econolupti uh, side of uh, North Carolina. And um, the young bulls usually practice on trees, and sometimes they come out of the wood line still wearing them. So it looks like he got caught up in a muscadine or a grapevine, and uh, he wore this the whole day that I was there. He never did shake it. This is the, uh, the head bull of this herd. So they split off in the Catalucci herd about 10 years ago. 
Um, he has been able to keep control of the herd up to this point. He's in the last couple of years, he's getting some pretty good uh, competition. So his time and his reign may be getting close to being over. And this is called lip curling and he's checking to see if the cows are in season. Here we got a mom and a, a aunt walking the young in across the water. So fall colors always makes for a pleasing composition, but also remember that you have your river systems and your creeks when you're doing your elk photography, they're always near the water. And if you can get something like this, it just adds another component and another di dynamic to the uh, composition. So here we have the uh, head bull again. Uh, he just, I waited, this uh, wasn't much color in this field, and I waited and waited until he walked in front of this, uh, probably a sweet gum and a dogwood and some red stuff and some viney stuff as well to give more color to the composition itself. All right, this is called the shadow of the bear. So it happens twice a year, but we're gonna focus on the fall. The shadow of the bear is um, between Highlands and Cashiers, North Carolina, and it's at Rhodes Big View Overlook. So it happens for just a little over two weeks from October 15th to the beginning of November. This is off from Highway 64, and it happens for 30 minutes each evening, and you have to have sunshine. So there are years where you don't get this to happen at all. So this is a ref, uh, the shadow of a mountain. And when you're doing this photography, the sun is almost directly at your back. And when it first starts, it takes small shape and it just keeps changing and getting larger. And eventually for that last uh, 10 minutes or so, it really does look like a bear. This is up at Newfound Gap. So we do sunrises from Akana Lefty Overlook a lot. And in the fall, you can capture some other things while you're there. And one of them is getting the road going through the fall colors. This is Bald River Falls, and it's at the beginning of the Chirahala Skyway. I took this last fall, and if you're looking for dates, this one was taken on the 24th of October. Of course, we know that fall colors are different each year, but in general, you're looking at um, that last week of October for fall colors. By the way, there's a limited opportunity here. This was taken from the bridge. You can try to get down under the bridge, but be careful climbing the rocks and, you know, water levels go up and down during different years. So you have to be careful getting down there. So this is an opportunity on the Chirahala Skyway as well. So I think this is actually in the North Carolina side of it. And I was laying on the ground and getting uh, sports cars, antique cars, Harley Davidson's, whatever I could get coming around this corner. So if I was taking a break, I'd be kneeling down. And as soon as I saw the vehicle or motorcycle I thought would be interesting, then I went down to laying on the ground to get the photograph. So one of the things you're probably going to be doing on the trip is taking uh, sunrises from the Foothills Parkway. And this is the old section of the Foothills Parkway. And this is before sunrise. So remember that um, sunrises happen before um, and then as soon as you're done with the sunrise, always turn around and look what's behind you because now you've got that beautiful soft light. And if you're doing this during the fall season, that's what you're going to want to be capturing is uh, maybe a couple fall trees together or something. So I'm not going to do too much here. This is a wild turkey in Cades Cove. And whenever you have a frost, it creates a different dynamic. And of course, I'm laying on the ground to get this shot as well. So you got your fall that leads into your winter. We're very fortunate here to have 
um, usually get our first snow at the end of October. Sometimes we only get four to six different dustings to three inches in a, in a season, but we usually get one at the end of October and the beginning of November, which is when we have our fall colors. So this is a Carter Shields cabin. And again, this is taken from the back side of the cabin. And I'm basically standing inside of this tree, trying to get the leaves to cover different parts of the image the way that I want. And of course, if you have wind, you gotta wait on that too. So it may take a little while to get this type of shot. This is at the um, Dan Lawson cabin and there's not too much for fall colors right there. I think those are gum trees, but it was just enough to surround this one building that sets to the side of the rest of the cabins. And we've got a good frost going on. It looks like we actually have a hoar frost on this one. Um, all the little limbs are crystallized white. I was fortunate to get four out of five years. I was able to get bears in the snow we didn't have snow last year, um, so I, I lost my uh, streak. But um, it's kind of rare to find, and for those of you who don't live here, this would be a super rare thing. You would have to like come for a week and hope you get snow and then hope to find a bear in the snow. That being said, one of the best places to see them since Cades Cove is closed a lot when we do get snow is on the way up to Cades Cove. So Crib Gap and her babies in that area right there um, is one of the best spots and that's where this was taken. So wild hogs aren't seen all the time in Cades Cove. They are come out at night a lot. One of the best opportunities is when we get a storm at the end of the day and they think it's nighttime and then all of a sudden the sun breaks back out again and you can get wild hogs. This is uh, even more rare because they don't use, they're not usually in line like this. They do this marching routine when they are leaving one feeding ground and going to another one that could be as far as a mile away. So to protect the babies, they actually have an adult and a couple of the pig, piglets and then a couple, you know, a boar. Uh, so they, they line up that way to protect them from any coyote or whatever might be uh, watching them. This was taken, by the way, right after the Missionary Baptist Church. As soon as you come around that corner, and you got a field on the left and the right. Uh, this was taken on the left. Dan Lawson Cabin. So the peaks that you're seeing are not part of the Appalachian Trail. They would be on the higher peaks behind that. Um, but if you get an opportunity to get into Cades Cove when there is snow, uh, you want to capture as many of the cabins as you can. The wildlife might be a little tougher for you. So um, if you've done your cabins over and over, you know what angles you may already like, and you just go repeat the same thing that you do in the summertime and capture them with the snow. Try to uh, look for something that doesn't have footprints in it and be careful not to overexpose. So you can blow out your white snow really easy. So make sure you're metering that right. So I was fortunate this winter, uh, past winter, we didn't have much snow, but the winter before we had six pretty good size, like one to three, three to six snows. And four of those times, I was the only person in Cades Cove. Uh, I was lucky that I was able to get in the gate. It was open at first. I got in there, I started hiking into the woods, I'm photographing barred owls, and I even got a bobcat this day. And when they swept everybody out, I wasn't at my vehicle because I was in the woods doing photography. So another advantage of not staying on the roads is uh, if they do close Cades Cove, then you can be in there by yourself. They don't lock the back gate. You can always get out of Cades Cove. Carter Shields Cabin. So you've heard me talk a lot about uh, being on the ground and this is no different. I actually walk in the woods in these hemlocks and stuff, crawling around sometimes, trying to get the framing right to cover over the sky over these cabins. And uh, on this particular day, we had snow, no footprints. 
and I was able to get the greenery around the outside the way that I wanted. So people wonder how lucky I am and then how much time I spend on a certain subject. And in this case, I was photographing this buck and another buck fighting for about 45 minutes. And when they broke apart, I could tell it was gonna go to this fence. I backed through the only opening in the fence, got down on my knee, put it in the right speed setting I wanted and shot multiple shots as it went over. One thing to remember when you do these type of shots is always pan with your subject. I don't care how fast you're shooting. If you pan with a subject, you're going to get that frozen sharp image that you're looking for. You don't want to shoot too fast because if you do, you won't see, say, like the tail whip that you see in, in the subject. So you can't just shoot it ultra fast too where there's no movement at all, but make sure that your head and your eye is locked on and that's ultra sharp. This is a, a cabin, uh, I should say a barn, that's over in uh, Ware's Valley. And again, this is one of those images I knew it was going to be a black and white because of all the whispering limbs of the trees and then all the lines on the barn boards themselves. Uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of good color in it. So when you're looking at it, if you're going to take the time, you're, you're analyzing whether it would make a good black and white. And I came to the decision it would and I walked out to get the shot. River otters, um, so very nomadic, very difficult to find in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's a little bit easier. If you can find them one day, there's a good chance you can go back a couple days later and they'll still be in the same area. So that's the only time that river otters don't move a lot. So they usually winter in a spot they know will hold a lot of fish in the winter. Um, this was taken on Mill Creek. So Mill Creek is the one that behind the mill in the visitor center and runs all the way over to Abrams Creek. And uh, one winter I had him in there pretty good and I photographed him several times. This is a Townsend Visitor Center. So typically when we do summer shots we don't include too much sky especially if it's a boring blue sky but every once in a while you get a dramatic sky or it will set off the image by including more sky and that's what i've done in this image and also um all these pictures are in 16 9 format to to be full screen on my monitor so if you have a monitor or something that's large hopefully it's filling up your screen so whenever you stretch your landscapes or crop them to uh, wide and narrow, it looks better. And in this case, um, it's also a little bit of a sign of um, like a commercial where they do selective coloring. So it's almost a black and white image, but it is a color image that has bright color on the design of the barn itself. This is a coyote that I got in Cades Cove, and I will tell you that it got within about 20 feet of me. I had two friends with me, and when it went by, I was trying to use autofocus, and this is the only image that I used, that can use out of the 10 that I took of the animal. So when you're shooting in big snowflakes like this, or even heavy rain, be warnful that your autofocus will catch on one of these big snowflakes and then you will lose your sharpness in the animal itself. So after doing this, I um, do a lot of snow photography now, and I will switch to manual focus when I see a lot of heavy, uh, big snowflakes like this. So that's a, a good little trick to know. Um, use autofocus when you can, but if it's hurting you, be sure to be able to switch quick to manual focus. This is the wedding chapel it was the heartland wedding chapel in uh townsend tennessee it is now called the abbey it's a um bar restaurant so it looks a little different because it does have a big red sign across the front of it that says abbey but it's a neat little photograph for winter or summer so uh it's right on the little river in townsend and it's one street over from the main street 
So I call this snow pop. So when you're photographing your subjects and you have some nice white flakes and you got uh, some lighting behind you that will light them up, look and search for some darker backgrounds. So something that will make the snow pop off the background and it creates a uh, you know, really pleasing um, photograph and image. You can tell that this buck is uh, really swole up. He is in the rut. And this is a tree that's being used over and over by the bucks as they go by. So one thing about Cade's Cove that you need to know is there's more than one rut, sometimes four or five. And I have seen ruts in January. So they keep their antlers for a very long time, longer than anywhere I've seen in the United States. A lot of times not leaving their, losing their antlers until about April 1st. This is a, one of my favorite images that I've taken. Cades Cove was closed. I hiked in this day to get this shot. I knew that the snow was melting. It was about 30 degrees. I didn't leave any prints myself in case someone came behind me. I went all the way around the structure. This is a John Oliver cabin. And when I picked my tripod up to leave, the snow melted and slid off the roof. So. I was happy that I did the sacrifice of uh, hiking in there to get the shot and that it worked out for me that I didn't go all the way out there and, and not have this shot. But again, this is a image I've been taking for years and years, 25 years using this tree to frame my shot. And then everything came together on this one day, blue skies, the shadows and the snow. So you don't, you practice these things and you know where your angles are and then you hope that someday something like this will happen. My first bobcat I ever got um, was in Cades Cove. It took 22 years to get this shot. So we all have our things that we do good at or we're more lucky at. Bobcats weren't mine for a long time. Um, after taking 22 years to get this shot, I've gotten like four or five more in the last six years. So they're coming a lot faster now. This was uh, taken right after that big parking lot that we looked at um, at the beginning of the presentation. So once you go around the corner from the big overlook, um, that's where this was at. Hyatt Lane. I use this for a teaching image because it has some things, some of the things we know why it's good and some of the things our brain just works a certain way. So we read left to right. So we know that we like our roads and our pathways coming in from the left side but after it comes into the middle of the image and it brings your eye in, then it goes away from you and it gives you depth of field and gives you that 3D uh, feeling and gives you a lot of depth to the image. It kind of has the rule of thirds going on with the grass and the mountains and the sky. Um, so even though it's a winter shot, there's no leaves on the trees, we got the whispering uh, fog and we got the mountains uh, and you can see the ridges with the black and white. So it makes for a really good black and white photograph. So this is about to happen now. Um, our winter arrivals will be coming in the next couple of weeks. This is a Northern Harrier Hawk. And I've uh, devised a couple plans. If you try to walk out into a field to get these hawks, they just simply work away from you and you'll probably never get the shot. So I found a couple of places where the fields funnel in and I hide in the wood line and then I pop out and do handheld sometimes to get the shot of the bird as it goes through a narrow passage, maybe only 30 yards from me. This is a winter shot as well, even though it has all this color. This is called golden light. So it was just magical that morning. This is taken from the wooden bridge in Cades Cove. And uh, there's no leaves on the trees, but the trees kind of give it a, a dynamic feel, twisting the way it does. This could probably work as a black and white image, but I really like uh, the strong color that's bouncing off the water and coming through the fog. So the other arrivals uh, in the wintertime are the short-eared owls. So this is one that's flying by me. And this is an example of, and this is kind of rare, 
you don't usually see the tufts on top of the head on the short eared owl. Usually they're laying flat. In this instance, I was able to walk up to the animal. Um, I started at 150 to 200 yards and I was able to photograph the short eared owl from about 30 feet away. But it's a good example of showing the tufts, the signaling devices on the top of the head. And another one flying by. Nice bokeh in the background. And that's pretty much the end of that. Now I'm just going to uh, talk about my, um, my gallery is the Cades Cove Gallery. Um, be sure to stop in if you come visit this area. And if you happen to be interested in any of the images that you saw tonight, we have an online store and that's listed there as well. So I do guided tours, as I've mentioned a couple times uh, in the presentation. Um, I've done everything from small drop, drops of water to the, the black bears in Cades Cove. And if you're interested in that, be sure to check out my website. So the Snowy Owl guided tour, this will be the eighth year that I've done that. So it's a location in New England. And if you're interested in photographing snowy owls, it's just a weekend tour, and that's the dates for that. And if you're interested, you can follow me on social media.